good to be with you again and I bring the greetings of the church in Hazelmere and we pray the Lord's richest blessing upon you and your pastor as a fellowship here. I want us to turn in God's word this morning to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3 and to very well-known words in verse 23 and verse 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I don't know whether, as we've come to the end of the holiday season, whether you've had time away, whether you've gone to a new place, and perhaps if you have gone to a new place, that you are in the habit of buying things like guidebooks. So if you were to go on holiday to France, for example, and you went to WH Smith or any other good bookshop that's available, and you went and bought a guidebook for that particular country, you would find in those books a tremendous amount of information as to what you can do when you're on your holiday. There may be things that don't interest you in that book. There may be things that you think to yourself, that would be nice, but I can't afford to do what is being recommended. And it may give you ideas and you think to yourself, well, perhaps I will go and explore this place or the other. And so with a guidebook, you pick and choose as to what kind of things you want to take from it and you leave those things that don't interest you. Now, the days in which we live today are very sad and deplorable indeed, in that the Word of God is no longer seen as authoritative, but it seemed very much like a guidebook for men and women to pick and choose the bits and pieces they want to keep and to ignore the things they don't find quite so palatable. And this has become very popular in society. And it's also occurring in many so-called professing churches as well. And so the Bible is seen as nothing more than a guide to life. Now we know the Word of God is a guide, We know from Psalm 119 and 105 that the Word of God is described as being a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. But many people today see it as something that they can pick and choose, the bits they want to keep and leave those things that they don't want. People today say the Bible must be relevant, and anything that doesn't conform to society's understanding of things Uh, It must be done away with. So rather than God's word shaping society, society is now shaping the way in which God's word is understood and the way in which God's word is applied. We have seen very clearly in the last few months how the leaders of the Church of England, for example, there could be other examples that we could turn to, but leaders in the Church of England have disregarded the clear teaching of God's word. Only a few months ago they had debated and they've agreed that uh, women bishops should be brought into the church. Well, not only that, uh, a few weeks ago uh, there was a debate in the House of Lords concerning the assisted suicide bill. And what that was saying was that it would encourage people to help those that were nearing to the end of their life. And there was this debate taking place in the House of Lords. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Carey, he suggested and said that it was perfectly acceptable and completely consistent with Christian teaching to help somebody uh, end their life. Shocking. Has the former Archbishop of Canterbury never read the Ten Commandments? Does he not understand the realities of uh, death? And what happens at death, the judgment of God and the real places of heaven and hell. And we see how God's word has been manipulated. It's been altered, it's been changed. And here the Archbishop of Canterbury is picking and choosing the parts uh, that he wants to use and does away with the other things that he does not want. So the Bible isn't a guidebook necessarily or solely for life but it is a report into man's fatal condition. If you want to know why there are so many problems in this world, 
Why you want to know why there's things like sickness and ill health? Why there are wars? Why there are atrocities taking place? God's word will tell you what the condition is. And so we have detailed from Genesis to Revelation a report into man's fatal condition. But we thank God that the Bible doesn't stop there. We also have a report into what God has done to remedy man's condition. So we have these two ideas, we have these two main thoughts, man's sin and God's grace. And I want us to look at these things this morning. So man's fatal condition. When I use the word man, I'm talking about all of mankind, every human being that has ever lived. What is the fatal condition that each one of us has? Well, we read something of that in our service earlier, and we read from Genesis chapter 3. And in the beginning of the Bible, we have the historical account of how this world came into being. How that everything round about us was brought into existence. And we know from the opening accounts of Genesis that it was by the word and through the power of God. We see how it took six literal 24-hour days and everything that was done in creation was described as being good. Now we must be very careful when we read those words to understand exactly what it means. Perhaps if you think back to your school days, that might be easier for some than others, but when you think back to your school days and you had your report at the end of term or the end of year, uh, you perhaps had for maths good and for art in my case very poor and in the case of things like science okay average and perhaps another subject may be very good when we hear the word good perhaps we have an impression that that means about average or just above average when god uses that word good to describe his creation it isn't just above average it means that it was good. There was no imperfections in it. We know that God is described as being good. The Lord is good, as Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7 states. God is good in his essential character. There is no error with him. There is no falsehood with him. And so everything that he created back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, he says was good. It was a perfect world. There was no corruption, no decay, no genetic mutations. There was nothing that could be said, uh, that was said to be uh, not quite perfect. We know how God created Adam and Eve, and these righteous people were placed into a perfect world. And as we read from Genesis 3, we know what happened. God had commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know that the, the, the serpent, the devil, uh, craftily and, and manipulatively persuaded Eve to take from that fruit. She gave to her husband and he disobeyed God's command. And as a result of that, sin entered the world. No longer could the world be described as being good because it was now tainted. It now had imperfections. Sin was present. And as a result of that particular sin, every human being that has ever lived has this same fatal condition. We're all sinners before God. Sin is in the nature of every human being, and they are sinners by practice as well. And we could clearly see sin in the world. We just need to listen to news reports and you will see terrible atrocities taking place. A few weeks ago, the aircraft that was shot down in the Ukraine, the atrocities taking place in Syria. Only yesterday, or during the early hours of the today, uh, news has come of that uh, ISIS group in northern Iraq that have put to death that hostage. And we could go on and and think about these kind of things. We see sin everywhere. We see corruption of governments, organisations. We see institutions 
that reports are coming out of terrible wickedness that has taken place for decades. We see sin everywhere. We hear about it, we see it, and we experience it. Now the problem that we have is that we're very quick to see it in others. We're very quick to see the effects in nations, but we seldom see it in ourselves. If I was to go into Chichester this morning or to any town of our our country today and tell people that they're sinners before God, I'd have responses very similar from each one. Some might be emphasised with a a trip to A&E because I've broken my nose, but generally people wouldn't want to hear. They don't like to hear that they are sinners. But this is what God's word clearly reports. This is what God's word clearly states. In our text in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is mankind's universal problem. He is a sinner. He has fallen short of the perfect standard of God's glory. He has missed the mark. He has not attained to what he ought to have attained to. And so we see that all mankind have sinned. You may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm a good person. I live a good life. I haven't done anything terrible. Well, dear friends, when we read verse 23, there's no exclusions. There's no disclaimers. There's no exceptions. For all have sinned. All of us have sinned. And we've fallen and come short of the glory of of God. Up until a few weeks ago, in my secular work, I was working down in Brighton, and part of my journey would involve me catching a bus from the outskirts of Brighton into the town centre. There are many times when I um, managed to catch the bus on time, but there were a few occasions, and perhaps more than should have taken place, when I got to the bus stop to see the bus pulling away. I had missed the bus. Now, it didn't really matter whether I'd missed the bus by 10 seconds or 10 minutes, as it was on some occasions, uh, the result was still the same. I had missed that appointment. I'd missed that bus that I'd planned to get. In the same way, but far more seriously, we have all missed the mark that God has set. And it doesn't matter whether we miss it by a little or, in effect, by a lot, we miss the mark. We've fallen short of God's perfect standard. In the third chapter of Romans, Paul is here speaking predominantly to uh, believers who were Jewish by background and heritage. They had in their understanding that they were slightly better than other people. They thought that because of their heritage, the way in which they had the law of God, and they had kept the law of God in their own eyes, that they were somehow advantaged. And they were somehow better than the Jewish, better than the Gentiles that were around them as well. But Paul makes it very clear that whether they are Jew or Gentile, every one of us has the same problem. We've fallen short of God's perfect standard. And in verses 9 down to verse 19... Paul uses the Old Testament scriptures to show to these Jews how that God has consistently demonstrated how they have sinned. Verse 10, for example, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. These are words written to Jewish Christians. These are words written to the Old Testament Jews. And so God is making it very clear that whether Jew or Gentile, all have this same condition. No amount of subsequent law-keeping will ever make right a, a, a way in which we've broken God's law. The conclusion is, for all have sinned. For all of Paul's hearers, they are sinners. And as we are all human beings here this morning, 
we all have the same condition as well. We're all sinners before God. As a result of our sin, we don't deserve the blessing of God. We don't deserve the grace of God. We don't deserve the mercy of God. We deserve his wrath. And we know from God's word, the soul that sins, it shall die. God must punish sin. God cannot tolerate sin. God cannot bear sin in his, pro- in his presence. He is described as a consuming fire. And he will bring vengeance upon those that are wicked. God is holy and nothing unclean can enter in. That is what we deserve. We deserve God's punishment. Separated from his goodness, blessing and mercy and experiencing his wrath poured out in hell. How does this make you feel? Well, this should lead us to helplessness, to hopelessness. We're sinners before God. We cannot save ourselves. We can't do anything to help our condition. We've all fallen short. There are no amount of good works can get us back to where we ought to be. Or it should lead us to feeling helpless and hopeless. Well, that is God's report into man's condition. We're sinners before him and we have no hope in ourselves. Well, does Paul spend the next few chapters of Romans and all the other epistles going into how terrible we are and how worm-like we are and all these kind of things making us feel worse and worse? No, he doesn't. He tells us what God has done. He reveals to us God's glorious intervention. And so through God's word, we see how we've broken his commands. We have fallen short of his glory. But it also reveals to us what God has done, what God has intervened with. There's more to this story. There's more to this report. And so we have in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So although sinners are guilty before God, although sinners deserve the wrath of God, yet we see that God justifies. The word justification means uh, to be set innocent, to be counted as not guilty. And so a crime that we have committed, if we are to be justified, it would be counted as if we had not committed that crime at all. Just imagine you've committed a terrible crime. You've done something wicked and all the evidence is against you. The judge knows you're guilty. You know you're guilty. Your defence know you're guilty. The prosecution definitely know that you're guilty. The jury know you're guilty. Uh, Everybody in the courtroom knows you're guilty. And as the judge calls you to stand for your verdict to be read out, he tells you, rather than guilty as you suspect and as you know that's going to happen, you're told not guilty. Let the prisoner go. Well, you'd think the judge had lost his mind. You would think to yourself, what is happening? Uh, The prosecution would be incensed. The media would have a field day. They would think this is complete travesty. But this is what happens to a sinner. God justifies a sinner freely by his grace. God as creator, sovereign and judge, exercises his right to extend grace and mercy to sinners. Grace is that undeserved favour of God. Now people ridiculously think, how can they achieve, how can they earn the grace and the favour of God? Well, it doesn't make sense, does it? If it's grace, it is a free gift. If it's grace, it is undeserved. And if it is something that we've achieved or something that we've merited, then those are wages. But here we see the free grace of God. And throughout God's word, we're told time and time again that God's grace is a free gift to sinners. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have the idea of a gift. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're reminded and shown how it's not of works, but it is the gift of God. 
in Isaiah 55. We're told to come buy without money and without price. Well, how can you come and buy without money and without price? Well, that is what is on, on offer with the gospel. Do you remember those that account in Acts chapter 8? Very sad account of a, a man who thought that he could somehow purchase with money the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 8 and verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. There it is. He thought that he could purchase God's salvation, God's gift of the Holy Spirit. And when he's told, your money perish with you. But in this chapter, we have the intervention of God. And it's, it's indicated in verse 21. Paul has been speaking about the desperate condition of man. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And then he goes on in verse 24 and says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We see here the intervention of God. We have in Ephesians chapter 2 a very similar idea. And there the apostle speaking to that church there, he describes in very clear detail what man is like. You hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of, dis of, children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But verse 4 shows us the intervention of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Our condition renders us guilty. Our condition renders us hopeless. But God intervenes and God acts. God has done something. God has shown and has demonstrated his power that sinners that were destined to hell are made free and set right by his grace. What has God done? Well, we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Has God just done away with his justice? Just switched it off, merely ignoring it? No, God is just. He cannot just dispense with his justice. God is just, but God is merciful at the very same time. We see that punishment is administered and, guilt, uh, and guilty sinners are set free. We find that guilty people are declared innocent and God is just and yet is passing over his judgment, we may say. We may say, well, how does this all work? How does it all come together? Well, it all comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ stands and makes the payment. He pays the debt. He endures the punishment for our sin. He receives the consequences of our sin. And it's all because of him. So as we look upon that cross scene, as we look upon Golgotha's hill, there we see three crosses. On the middle cross is where we should have stood and where we should have hung. But in the mercy of God, Christ Jesus has hung there in order that he may pay the penalty for our sin and there render us and set us free and count us not guilty. The Lord Jesus Christ comes into this world. He endures the wrath of God. He makes the payment in full. 
And the Holy Spirit works and applies this precious blood of Jesus. When you think of those words, it is finished, that Jesus uttered from the cross. Do you think of them as words of despair and anguish? He can't take any more? No, those words demonstrate, reveal to us that the penalty has been paid, the price has been fulfilled, and every work that he has come to do has been completed. So it's not a, a cry of despair, but rather a shout of tremendous victory. And the Lord Jesus Christ endured so much in order to set sinners free. The Lord spoke other words on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was another cry that he made. We cannot begin to un understand what that meant for the perfect Son of God to experience the wrath of God poured out upon us. He became our propitiation. He is the wrath ending sacrifice. So as God comes to bring wrath upon us, instead of us, he pours it on his son instead. Where does this leave us this morning? We have the report of our fatal condition. The question comes, is it still our fatal condition? Are we still in that state where we are sinners, heading for a lost eternity? If we are without Christ, that is our condition this morning. But if that is the case, how helpless and hopeless we are. The scriptures conclude for us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is where we are, unless God has justified us. If we are without Christ, then hell awaits us. You may say, well, I will try and do better. I'll turn over a new leaf. Well, all the trees of the forest and all the trees of this nation and throughout this world wouldn't have enough leaves for us to turn over in order to make us right with God. No amount of good works can ever undo an act of breaking of God's commands. We cannot be justified or declared not guilty through any work or payment on our behalf. As it was told to Simon, thy money perish with thee. Or in other words, thy good works perish with thee. We cannot buy salvation because it is given by God. We're justified freely by his grace. It's only of God's grace that we're saved. It's only because of his intervention and it's only because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And so we must believe on him. That means turning from sin and seeking the mercy of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Oh, just think, if we reject so great salvation, how desperate our condition is. You may be a believer here. You have times of unbelief. Doubts and fears creep into your heart. You will hear that whisper, and sometimes it's not a whisper, it's a shout, it's a shriek from Satan that will tell you and remind you of all that you have done. How do you respond? Very often what we do is say, well, you're right, devil. I have done what you have said. How can I be right with God? Surely his grace cannot save a sinner like me. Surely his mercy cannot stoop to somebody uh, like me and what I have done. Well, the right response should be this. Yes, you are right, devil. I have done everything that you have said and many more things beside. I have sinned in thought, word and deed. I have committed sins of commission and sins of omission. I have done dreadful and terrible things. But my answer to you is this, but God. Yes, I am a terrible, wicked sinner, but I am justified freely by his grace. And it's not through any small thing 
but it's through the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. So if you're filled with doubts and fears, hold fast to these words, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. But there may be times when we can forget uh, where we have come from. We can forget how sinful we are by nature. And we can also forget how gracious God is. We can minimise our sin and we can minimise what God has done for us. And we begin to think that we have some kind of perverse uh, uh, merit of God's salvation. We must come back to these words that we've sinned before God, we've fallen short, but we're justified freely by his grace. In our evangelism, in our witness as a church and as individuals, we can sometimes have unrealistic expectations of unconverted folk. We think to ourselves that, well, surely they should behave better. Surely they should do this or do that. Well, spiritually speaking, they're corpses. And you wouldn't expect a corpse to do anything other than to lie in a grave. That is why we must pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would come in power and would revive and stir up the bones of men and women's hearts so they will seek the Lord. We don't just preach the word, we depend upon the Spirit to come in power as well. And when we think about anybody that is converted, we pray God that that would happen. It is not through the cleverness of of the preacher. It's not through the persuasions of men and women. It's because of the grace of God using those means. And so that will help us to realise that anybody saved is another token, another demonstration of the grace of God and help us to give glory to his name. Psalm 13 verses 5 and 6. I have trusted in thy mercy My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. That is the testimony of the Lord's people, because of the great things that he has done for us. Amen.